Today, you'll hear from a business consultant who is an expert at helping companies bring new products to market and penetrate new markets that they haven't played in before. We'll talk through the process of evaluating whether or not a company should even go there. You know, is this a good market? Does this product make sense? How do you gather information to make those decisions? And then how do you use an iterative process to come up with your value proposition, develop your business plan, and actually take this product to market? There's advice in here for all kinds of professionals, whether you're in marketing, sales, or product management, you'll glean something out of this episode that you can use during your next market launch. Let's do this. Welcome to Content Marketing Engineered, your source for building trust and generating demand with technical content. Here is your host, Wendy Covey. Hi, and welcome to Content Marketing Engineered. On each episode, I'll break down an industry trend, challenge, or best practice in reaching technical audiences. You'll meet colleagues, friends, and clients of mine who will stop by to share their stories. And I hope that you leave each episode feeling inspired and ready to take action. Before we jump in, I'd like to give a brief shout out to my agency, True Marketing. True is a full service agency located in beautiful Austin, Texas, serving highly technical companies. For more information, visit truemarketing.com. And now on with our podcast. Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Content Marketing Engineered. I'm joined today by John Schober. He is the founder of Sorian. And today together, we're going to be talking all about entering a new market, whether that's with a product or as a new company. And uh, can't wait to hear your thoughts on that, John. Look forward to speaking with you. Well, but before we get started, um, I'd love for you to just share a little bit about your career journey and what led you into becoming a business consultant. Sure. So postgraduate school, uh, I was working for Delphi Automotive, so a large automotive supplier. When I say large, $26 billion at the time. And uh, they were almost exclusively working in the automotive industry. And uh, they have a extensive portfolio of technology that could could, could have potentially been leveraged outside of the automotive industry. And um, my role with them was to figure out which of those technologies could be taken to other markets and what markets that they should go into. Um, and so it wasn't just the market analysis, but it was the business strategy, uh, modeling the decisions, uh, basically how would we take that idea of let's take this technology to another market segment and, uh, and, and actually execute on it. So I left Delphi, went to work for another large company, billion dollar company called GraphTech, um, focused in carbon and graphite. And they had a new division that was started to do just this, take a core technology into a new market. Um, my role was marketing manager and it was to, all right, what's our strategy here? How do we execute on it? Uh, went to a third company. Uh, after them, I was with them for about five years, went to another company and they were looking to change their business model. They were an economic development organization in my hometown and they were looking at how do we change what we've been doing to what we should be doing to support the broader manufacturing sector. So I was with them for about three years and I realized in those three experiences that I think it was beneficial to not only to me, but to also prospective companies to be able to hire somebody to do that kind of work on a contract basis because hiring somebody to lead an effort to pursue a new opportunity can sometimes lead into, hey, we shouldn't do this. And so you hired somebody and now they go into a, I would go into a different role as a result. Yeah, what do we do like with this person? I like the, the work that I was doing. Yeah. Um, so for the last 11 years that I've been a consultant, um, that's basically what I've said to my clients is that I can be a contractor that can help you think through what new opportunities to pursue. Or if you know what opportunities you, you want to pursue, how do we develop the business plan around that, and then how do we execute on it? And I can be a very flexible resource for my clients on how to go about doing that. Um, but that's basically what I've been doing for the last, say, 10, 11 years as a contractor is helping businesses on the front end of um, uh, their business when they're trying to go out and do something new. I absolutely love hearing about your services and what you do because oftentimes small technology companies will come to us and ask True Marketing, hey, which 
vertical should I pursue and what should I do? And we'll say, no, 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 we're looking to you to answer that and us to do the work of, of everything that we do best. So oftentimes they are the exact person I'm sure that, that you'd love to be working with. So I'd love to just hear a little bit more about the process that you use when you're evaluating entering a new market and then um, making those business plans to do that. So what are, what are some of the first steps that you take? Yeah, so there's a theme that uh, I, I, I consistently come back to, uh, and I'll probably come back to it here in this session, and I do this with my clients, is that it's all about experimenting. And so if a company is in that early stage and saying, hey, we really need to pursue some opportunities outside of our current market, my advice to them is, all right, well, you need to learn and experiment with what other new opportunities you should be pursuing. And so it's not, let's invest hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars in this in this new opportunity because it sounds good to go in, say, to the medical industry or in the aerospace and defense market. Um, and, and so you, you figure out what that first experiment looks like. And a first experiment could be uh, all internal. Let's talk with everybody internally about why we should pursue a opportunity outside of our core and what that opportunity should be. I don't recommend that as the only step, but it's often a very good first step. The second step is get outside of the company and start going and talking to people who, uh, in talking to current customers is a great way to go about doing that, especially if those customers are also in those industries that that uh, you, you might consider pursuing, but uh, at talking to people that you, you don't have a relationship with that are in that industry, theorizing about why somebody might buy from you, um, what's the value proposition that might attract those people to pursue business with you in the future. Um, so those are some of the early things that companies can do that don't take a whole lot of time and, and effort um, yeah, that will it, start real to quick get the organization before... a lot more confident. Right, right. And, and I mean, you say it doesn't, uh, take a lot of time, but it, it kind of does. Yeah, I, it, it's not as formal, so it can happen fast. But of course, it's a lot of qualitative information. Um, how do you get in front of the people that aren't your customers? Is that Does that look like going to trade shows and industry events or reaching out to people on LinkedIn? What do you do yeah. in that case? Trade shows are great because you got you have lots of people uh, all in one place that you can ask lots of different questions. So it's not always practical to be able to, to go to a, a trade show, but if you can do it, you can afford to do it. Uh, I highly recommend it. And there's some strategies towards uh, going and finding the right people and having the right conversations there. But yes, I highly, highly recommend that. If a trade show isn't a possibility, um, and even with a trade show, you, you have to go into the conversation with whomever you're having uh, with some theory as to why you're looking at that opportunity that they would care about. So you could go to somebody and say, hey, we're looking to go outside of a new market and we want your opinion about whether or not we should do it. And the first question they're going to ask is, OK, well, why would I buy from you? And so you have to be able to answer that question, even if it's in theory. And so that's one of these things with the experimentation is you have to have a theory as to why somebody would buy from you. And you could say, well, I've been selling into the automobile, just as an example. I've been selling into the automotive market for all these years and we're really good on quality. And I think you guys would value our quality here. Um, tell me, but, but you, you, you give a little bit of that and then you go into a conversation with them about, well, wh what do you think about that? Is that enough? And they might come back and say, well, yeah, but everybody says they have great quality. I need more. And you mm -hmm. have to be able to, to talk more. And, and so you can talk more about why they might buy from you. Um, so that's a key part of this. And so whether you do that with a cold call, a cold email, um, referrals, uh, I highly recommend having those kinds of conversations with people that are in that market or near that market, have a theory as to why they might buy from you and then have a conversation about whether or not that resonates with them. Okay. And, and do people ever approach you suspiciously? Like, Oh, he's trying to, he's just trying to sell me something. This is a bait and switch. This isn't him trying to just get information. <laughs> Uh, all the time. Uh, uh, and, and, I mean, I, I try to avoid uh, putting myself in that situation because I, I don't have this, this approach of I'm trying to sell you a product. I'm more yeah. focused on kinds of questions. So if you went in and say, hey, we make this widget, I want to see if you guys would want to, are interested in buying this widget. Wrong way to try to have a conversation. The right way to have the conversation is, hey, I, we sell these widgets. These widgets solve these problems for our customers. We think we, they, these same widgets or similar widgets can solve problems for customers in your market. This is why people buy them currently. What do you guys think about whether or not you would also value these widgets and what kinds of problems might they solve? 
that's more of a conversation than it is a, is a, uh, a, a selling conversation. It's more of a back and forth conversation than it is, hey, will you buy this for me? So mm-hmm. I've learned over the years to not have a selling, have less of a selling conversation and more of a, hey, how can I solve your problem conversation? And people are generally more open to that. And if they don't want to talk with you, they'll let you know. And then you move on to the next. There you go. You have a thick to. skin. <laughs> yep. Have, um, do you find that when you're entering a new market, it's difficult to find research that already exists that you could go out and purchase or, you know, do a search and, and uncover, or uh, sometimes is that a helpful thing? It can be, but I would say for most of the clients that I work with, the products are so buried in that market that that information doesn't give you a whole lot of information that you can't find for free. The, the useful information in there might be, uh, some of it might be useful, but I think you can find it elsewhere. They tend to look at, uh, you know, take a 10,000 foot view and say, well, this is the market size uh, of, 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 of the broader market. And this is the growth rate. And those are good things to know about. And you can look at those kind of things for general technology trends and say, well, are those technology trends consistent with what I'm trying to bring to the market? Mm-hmm. Um, but you really have to go much, much deeper than that to get down into why will these people buy from me? Why would they buy from me? Even if I have something theoretical right now, you've got to get to that question. You, you've got to get to the answer to that question. Do I believe that when we develop our product or bring this product to this market, do I really believe that they're going to buy from me? You, nobody's going to give you a definitive answer, even when they tell you, I love your product. You should bring it to this market. You cannot fully trust that they're going to buy it until they actually buy it. And I've, okay. I've had false starts in, in, <laughs> in full-time roles, false, false starts in my consulting roles where people say, yes, I will buy it. And then they don't. So mm-hmm. this is why I talk about experiment, experimentation. You continue to learn more until you feel 100% confident that it's worthwhile for us to invest in this opportunity. But even if you feel 100% confident until they start buying, you really don't know. You have to be both an optimist and a pessimist. It sounds like as part of this Re- process. Realist is probably the better word I would use than a, than a pessimist. There you go. Yes, you have to understand <laughs> that there's risks and there, you need to be able to accept those risks if you're trying to pursue new opportunities like that. Fair. So the marketer in me is listening to all of this feedback that you're getting and thinking, oh my gosh, that's a gold mine for creating a value proposition or messaging. Does that come next? Or first, are you fleshing out a formal business plan or what, what are you doing next? Yeah, I, I say the value proposition is definitely your starting point. And, and again, I don't believe you have to go outside of the organization to have a theoretical one, Mm -hmm. but until people start validating it, it's not a true value proposition that you can start to invest in. And so that's where that iterating back and forth in the conversations internal to the organization and with people external to the organization gets you to that point where you can start to say, Hey, I think this is, this is why people would buy from us. Um, and, and that's only the starting point. Now you have, now, now you have to answer this question. Well, how do we communicate that? Because it, w- w- when you're standing in front of somebody, showing somebody a widget, you have all this background information that you can give him or her. That's not how you're going to go out and sell this. The way you're going to go out and get people interested is through digital marketing, trade shows, whatnot. And you need snippets, you need uh, flyers, you need uh, things that you would post on LinkedIn that are going to capture their attention. And so you need to translate from what, you know, what's, what's their reason for, for buying from us into something that's going to get their attention that you would use through a, a normal channel. And that takes some time and it takes some iterating internally. I often recommend come up with what you think those snippets are, the, the value proposition, the language that you would use and test it in smaller markets, uh, smaller groups of people. And this is this works just as well in, in a business to business environment as it does in a consumer environment. It's just a little bit different challenge because there, there aren't as many businesses out there as there are consumers. Um, but still go through that process of, all right, here's what we think will work to capture people's attention and to get us, get them to reach out to us, test it. And if it works, then run with it. If it doesn't work and it may work with some smaller group of people. And then you figure out if I've got a different segment that I need to pursue, the language might be a little bit different. It, it, again, it's just a constant process of iterating. Um, I, I always, I always feel like you never really truly get there until you're about 10 years into the business and you've been selling it for that long. 
Um, it, it's just always iterating and trying to figure out what's the right way to pursue this. And I love setting that expectation up front of we're going to iterate like crazy and just expect it. And this message won't stay how it is today. This isn't like, you know, set it and forget it type of, of thing. So I'm, I'm right there with you. And, yep. and, and let me, luckily, let me I want to add just one, one small point yeah. to that. Um, sure. What I've talked about thus far has been conversational and basically showing the potential people that you think might buy it what you already have. A better thing to do, but what's also risky to do is to do a little bit of development work to create a prototype that shows them that you've invested in this. It's not just, hey, I'm dabbling in it, but well, these guys are serious about this because they've created this prototype and it's showing me what, what they think it can do for me. Um, but if it's gonna cost you $10,000, $50,000, $100,000 to make a prototype like that, then there's obvious risk there. So the, the team members need to figure out, can we, should we create a prototype that will make it easier to capture some people's attention? And the answer to that is not always obvious, but it is something still to consider because I've always, it's been my experience that if I'm out talking to potential customers in new markets, if I have something that shows what we're considering doing and that I've invested time and money in, into this, those people that you're trying to talk to are going to give you feedback and, and critique what you've done already. Whereas if you just talk to them about something theoretical, they're just going to nod their head and say, yes, that's interesting. And they're going to effectively say, come back to me when you have a, a prototype or something that I can, I can sink my teeth into. That's tangible. Yes. Right. Right. And, and it could be a software demo on, on that side of things. Right. Or, you know, worst case of video, if this is something that, that can't be physically brought to somebody. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And it doesn't have oh, to be a perfect crude. prototype. It can often look fa fairly crude. If you're selling to an engineer, uh, they, they get this, like you, you don't have to show them a perfect product, Sh show them something that gives them a sense for conceptually what you're trying to do. Engineers love that stuff. I mean, your audience knows that and understand that, but it's worth stating doesn't have to be perfect. It, it just has to be enough to get them to give you that feedback and that, and, and that criticism. And again, engineers love to do that. Right. Oh, all of a sudden I'm having flashbacks to crossing the chasm. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that book will always be a, a Bible for this in, in some ways, won't it? <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, Good. Well, so let's let's take it from we validated this is a good idea. We've iterated on our messaging. We have a prototype and we're feeling pretty good, feeling pretty confident, John. What comes next? Really, the whole process is all about taking risk out of your decision to pursue the opportunity. So if we've done everything that you said um, that you just shared, uh, then where is the next next piece of risk? that we need to address. And, and often with a manufactured product uh, is, will it work in, well, will it work? And then will it work in, my, in the customer's product? And that can often be an expensive thing to, to do, but what engineers often do is they, they, they put it into an environment that, that provides some reasonable approximation of the environment that they're going into. In the case of software, um, I don't wanna say it's easy, but it's presumably easier to code up something, put it on, uh, you know, on, on your computer, or on your phone, let people use it. Doesn't have to, again, doesn't have to be perfect. Um, but it, it really does come down to where do we take the, where do we need to continue to take the risk out? And, and for, again, for a manufactured product, that's often what it comes down to. Um, uh, manufacturing companies often look at, well, can we make what we say we're going to make? And so that's per, what can, can we make what we think we're going to be able to make? And there's often a lot of risk there. It has nothing to do with engaging people on the outside. I wouldn't recommend doing that until the customers or prospective customers say, yep, we think we want to buy that. Then you need to go, all right, can we manufacture it? Will it do what it's intended in our little test environment? And then there's that prospect of taking it outside of our internal little test environment and putting it into something that more closely mimics what the customer um, uh, is going to expect to see. And again, there's choices there about how much, uh, how much time and effort and money to put into those. But in some cases, it's, it's just a necessity. The customers will not buy until it gets proven. And I've been in those situations where I thought I can convince them, well, why don't you commit to buy it? It's, it's looking pretty good. Uh, and uh, they said, all right, maybe. And then they get to somebody else in the organization who says, nope, sorry, we got to take the risk out. We've got to do X. We've got to do Y. Um, 
the more you can do to make the customer feel confident that it's going to do everything intended, A, you can make it, B, it's going to work in their product, C, that you're going to be able to charge me an amount that I, I believe is going to work for us. And that's part of this too, is evaluating, is, is, is evaluating the pricing um, and your cost model, because there's nothing worse going through all this investment on your part, on their part, saying, hey, it's going to be a $10 widget. And then we get through all of this and say, hey, sorry, it's $20. Yeah. All right. Well, I can't buy big it. Surprise. <laughs> yeah, big surprise there. So it's, it's the technical part. Internally, can we make it? It's a technical part externally. Will it work in their environment? Uh, and then there's the business part of it. Can we deliver it at the price and cost that they're talk that, that they're comfortable with? All of those things need to be considered as you're going through this iteration slash experimentation mm -hmm. process. And support, of course, part of that too. Uh, so I'm hearing again a lot of iteration and uh, collaboration between R and D, marketing, and sales. So what is what does that look like for those three groups to collaborate during a new product introduction process? Yeah, so I'll start with this. What I've seen some companies do is to say, well, let's just use all the same people that we have in R&D, in sales, in marketing to go pursue this new opportunity. And this is where the human side of pursuing a new opportunity comes in, is that those A, those people are all comfortable with what they've been doing for days, weeks, months, years, and they want to be, they all want to be successful. And if they all said, well, you guys got to do your day jobs, uh, oh, sorry, we all have to do our day jobs, but now we have to go pursue this new opportunity. There's a lot of risk there for them. And a lot of people will be very hesitant to, to do that. And so e even if the CEO comes and says, Hey, marketing people, I want you to go out and, and, uh, uh, you know, start, start a campaign and salespeople, I want you to spend 10% of your time, 20% of your time on, uh, on finding new customers in this area and, and R and D who often are pulled into application support for current customers, go develop this new widget. Every one of those people is going to be sitting here thinking, well, what's this mean to my job and to my role? And really how much time should I put into it? Especially when everybody's coming to me and saying, you need to do all this stuff that gives us returns this week, this month, mm. this year. So I need sales, I need revenue, I need profits, I need this new product out, I need this application work done. So the CEO, whoever's leading this effort needs to take that into account. Um, how do I make sure that these people feel comfortable that however much time that they're spending it, it on this fits into our overall plan. Now, ideally, and this is easier for very large billion dollar companies to do is you set aside a team of people and says, this is your full-time job. But for most companies, you don't, even for billion dollar companies, they often don't do that. Yeah. Um, but let's say theoretically you could, those people need to work together in this iterative process and it's not R and D you go work off for a couple of weeks, marketing, go do your thing for a couple of weeks, sales, you go do your thing for a couple of weeks, either in series or in parallel. And then we'll come back late together later, those three groups. And, and often it's not just them. I mean, you've got operations, you've got purchasing that are often oh, yeah. involved, but let's just limit it to those three um, groups of people. They have to be looking at this and saying, how do we experiment together? How do we take out risk together? So that we at some point in time can go to our CEO and the executive team and saying, we're confident that this is going to work. We feel, we feel very confident. We can't be sure yet until people actually buy it, but we're, we've been working together on this and uh, th they need to be very flexible in how they work together. It, it, again, it's not just a set. And oftentimes people look at a set regimen that says, all right, we've got 10 weeks to do this. First two weeks are going to be this next three weeks are going to be that. Um, it really is more when you learn something and it could be the R and D guy learned something. It could be the marketing uh, guy learned something. It could be the salesperson learned something that changes what they do. And it's not mm -hmm. that it's not as hectic as I'm describing it. Um, but it's, it's more hectic than a lot of people want it to be. They want it to be regimented. If we do X, Y, and Z, then this will follow. Yeah, and here's the formula, right? <laughs> it, yeah, here's the formula for getting there, and it's just yeah. not there. And you'll yeah. see all sorts of stuff on the internet where people show, well, we want to see the straight line from here to there. And really, uh -huh. well, you can get from here to there, but it's going to be this big loopy thing. Um, yeah. That is very real. And you got to have people that are comfortable in those environments, whether they're in sales, whether they're in marketing, whether they're in R&D. Um, mm -hmm. They have to be comfortable in this kind of this uncertain environment. 
and they've got to figure out how to work together. Again, it's all about reducing risk uh, and about responding to what the market is saying, not what the R&D person is saying, hey, I'd really like this product to look like this. Yeah. Not what the marketing person is saying, but well, I'd really like to advertise this through LinkedIn and not what the salesperson necessarily says and says, hey, I talked to this one company. It really is about what the market is saying, not about what any individual person is saying. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'm thinking back, I was on some of these teams at my days at National Instruments. And like you said, it's a very collaborative process. And every week that meeting would look different. And, and there'd be some weeks I remember that were less relevant to some people in the room and other weeks that were quite relevant. So there was some of that where it was more efficient to have everybody in the room, but the, the agenda would be all over the place depending on what customer feedback or what, what new information came up that week. So I think you yep. described that very accurately. Yep. Um, good. Well, for all of my Marcom people listening right now, what advice do you have to them for penetrating a new market, growing awareness? What have you seen work just whether it's anecdotally or for hardware, you could take what other path you want with this question, but what advice do you have? Yeah. I mean, LinkedIn is, is, it is a tremendous platform. If I had to pick one path to go, it, it, it would be that. And it's not just for reaching out directly to organizations. And I'm hopefully I'm not, everybody understands I'm not shilling for, for LinkedIn right now. Um, but it's just been my go-to for business to business that um, and we've done it. We've done advertising on it with some different clients. I've never done personally advertising on it. I tend to do more of the you know, direct reach out. Um, but often that's where people go. Um, they, they spend time there. Um, and so uh, trying to do it through Google ads, I've always been found has been very difficult. Facebook for the kinds of products that I'm in just doesn't work. Um, no. LinkedIn really is a, a good place to go. And I haven't found one yet that I would say is even comparable. Doesn't mean that there aren't some uh, other digital platforms that are also useful. I mean, often there's marketplaces, smaller marketplaces out there. Just as an example, the U.S. government, if you want to sell to the U.S. government, the Department of Defense, they often have platforms that you go directly and I highly recommend looking for anything like that as well, is that yeah. if there is a market specific place that people tend to go to, to uh, post RFQs or look for new opportunities or find new opportunities, then certainly find them. Um, but I wouldn't say there's one that I would say works across all industries. I would say getting the language of your customers right is more important than getting the language internally that everybody agrees with. Mm. And I can't tell you how many times I've been working with clients and in the companies I work for, everybody and their sister and their aunt and uncle has an opinion about how to say something, especially when you're pursuing a new opportunity like this, because it's, it's, it, it, it's unknown what the right language is, but the right language is the one that your customer that's going to resonate with your customers. And so if somebody says, yeah, but I like this language better, well, how do you know it's going to resonate more with customers? And if they don't have an answer to that, they say, well, we've got to default to the data that we have that has come from the conversations that we've had, the emails that we've sent, whatever. We've got to default to what we think is going to resonate with the customers. And, you know, to be fair to everybody else as part of that, they want to help. They want to be useful. Um, they have their own opinions uh, about this stuff. And, and that's fair because often people internally will come up with uh, good ways to say things. Uh, that you can go try out with those customers. Mm -hmm. But it, again, uh, I, I, my hope is always is that if when people have those good ideas and somebody on the marketing or sales side says, yeah, let's go give that a try. And it, and, and it turns out it doesn't resonate. Then we come back and say, hey, I'm sorry, it was a great idea, but it, it's just not resonating with them. Yeah. Um, and so for a marketing person to manage that process, it can be very <laughs> frustrating, but it's, it's, um, it's very positive uh, experience at the end when you do get something. I, I, again, it, I, I, I went this path in my career um, because you realize how hard it is. After, after you've done it a couple of times, you realize how hard it is to do it, to get many people working together in, a, in an organization to pursue a new opportunity. But at the end of it all, it's actually very rewarding. And it can be led by salespeople, marketing people, uh, commercial people. Often it's better than to have it led by an R&D person. Often... Uh, I've, I've been in organizations and clients where these kinds of efforts have been led by R&D people and God bless them. I, I you know, I, I love them to death. I, I, you know, my undergraduate was in engineering and I consider myself an engineer at heart, but having somebody lead this who is closer to the market is, is often very good. And so I think that 
for a marketing person to say, hey, I'll step up and lead these efforts. Again, I've, I've found it very rewarding. Yeah. Good. You know, uh, your, your story of everybody has an opinion and, uh, I'm reminded of how important it is to identify that who is that ideal target persona that you're pursuing. And, uh, just as a, as a quick story, there was once this company that the executive was, uh, you know, pushing 80 and was, like, we have to continue to have a print catalog because I love my print catalogs. I read them on my flights and I just, he was in love with the print catalog and, and, and the marketer had to turn to him and say, okay, but we're, we're pursuing a 20 to 30 year old design engineer. Who's a specifier, right? For yeah. this product, they're, they're not ever going to look at a catalog. So, you know, it doesn't matter that you love that. That's not who we're targeting. And, and it's just a, a simple story to just say that, Sometimes that's a, a way to help realign people that just have opinions, yep. right? But yep. I love Instagram. <laughs> no, yeah. no, 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 no. We're not yeah. doing that here. <laughs> yeah, it's about our customers. I, but, but you bring up a great point, and I didn't really speak to it just yet, and I'll, and I'll use a term uh, that's extremely important for people, is you have to unlearn what you've learned in working in the market that you've always been in. Now, if you're a startup, you get it. I'm, I'm pursuing something entirely new. I don't have to unlearn anything. But if you've been working in a business for years, decades, and you're pursuing a new opportunity, it's very powerful to be able to unlearn all of that and say, well, these are all the assumptions we've made all these years about what works over here. We can't assume that those are going to work over here, the same channels, the same language, same products. Um, and so everybody has to come in with a skeptical eye that says, yes, this is what we've done for all these years, but we're pursuing something new here with a different set of customers. We have to again, unlearn what we've already unlearn. done and only apply it into this new opportunity where it makes sense mm -hmm. to do so. Not just because we've always done it that way, but because it's the right thing to do in this new opportunity. Love it. Unlearn. That's a nice headline. Um, well, I, I bet there's some marketers listening going, oh my gosh, I wish I had a John in my company. So, and, and I think of a lot of what you describe is what I think of as a technical product manager, technical marketing manager are often tasked with being the lead person for this, right? And um, so when does a company, when are they ready for that role where it isn't R&D or an executive working straight with marketing, but you have this technical layer that, you know, brings it all together, helps to train sales, you know, all the things product managers do. Do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, I would say that um, hiring a technical marketer is without specifying it. I think it's very late in the process. I think a lot of the work that needs to be done to take risk out can be done by people in the organization. Um, but a lot of that depends on the, the kinds of people you have in the organization and how much work you expect them to do. So yeah. um, where, where I've been helpful at times is where a company says, Hey, I think these people could lead this work, but I'm not ready to take them off of what they're currently doing. And so mm -hmm. they'll hire me and th they'll understand that's that I true. can work within those three different groups and the other groups to try, try to pull them forward. And at some point in time, he's, he would say, all right, now I'm going to hand this off and, and I'm going to have somebody else lead this internally. As a consultant, I'm fine with that. I understand that's a, certainly a possibility. And so naming somebody to and maybe even saying 50 percent of your time is going to be on this is fine hiring somebody, you should be pretty far along down the process because you're talking about, you know, six figure uh, costs. Yeah. You should be pretty this far down the This is a commitment. Process. We, yeah, yeah, we have a viable product. We know we're committing to this for the long term. Correct. Now Correct. It's and, and if they create a division for this, then yeah, you'd hire a technical marketing manager. That's what happened yeah. with me with, with GraphTech is they create a division. They move some people into that division and they says, well, hey, we don't have a technical marketing manager. Let's go hire one. And that's what they did. So my experience is err on the side of doing that too late. Um, mm -hmm. Hire a contractor earlier, something, an amount, a dollar amount that you can put at risk and you feel comfortable with hiring somebody. Again, it's bad for the company. If there's somebody who's in currently in the company that you want as a uh, to, to give them a growth opportunity and mm -hmm. move them into a full-time role, that's one way where I might say, hey, let's do this earlier than rather than later. Yeah. Because if you if 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 the hiring people, the CEO, the the managers like this person giving them a growth opportunity like that, but helping them understand, yeah, there's risk here. And if it doesn't work out, then we'll make sure that we have a place for you. Um, if it doesn't work out, tremendous growth opportunity for people. 
it will keep them interested and engaged and excited, but you just have to make sure that you'll know what you do with them if things don't necessarily work out. But outside of that, uh, again, I would say, I would tend to recommend let's err on the side of, of doing it later rather than sooner. Okay, good. Well, John, where can people go to connect with you and learn more about your business? So the, the best place is to go to LinkedIn and just look me up at uh, John Sh- John and Schober. Um, I, I don't even know that I have a, a Saurian webpage uh, at LinkedIn. And I do not, I know I do not have a Saurian page. Uh, out <laughs> I think of you would the, know if you had a web. Yeah, I've been getting most of my referrals through my own research uh, and through uh, some referrals. Um, but mm-hmm. yes, if you just look me up and is the, uh, there are other John Shovers out there. I think I'm the only one associated with Sorian, uh, and I'm the one that's in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. So if you go to LinkedIn, you'll find me there and you can, uh, you can just hook up with me there. Um, and I can get you my email address and we can communicate after that. There you go. Well, we'll be sure to put a link to your LinkedIn profile in the show notes. And, uh, I really appreciate you coming on today. I enjoyed speaking with you, Andy. Thanks. Thanks for joining me today on Content Marketing Engineered. For show notes, including links to resources, visit truemarketing.com slash podcast. While there, you can subscribe to our blog and our newsletter and order a copy of my book, Content Marketing Engineered. Also, I would love your reviews on this podcast. So please, when you get a chance, subscribe and leave me your review on your favorite podcast subscription platform. Thanks and have a great day. 